Welcome to The Secrets of Success. By following the proven techniques of the guests who appear on this series, you'll learn that even successful people run into detours and failures, and how you can apply their success techniques to change your life. You're now listening to the most unique show on radio, the show dedicated to making you a success. Want more? Why not ask? Says our guest, Christine McKay. Christine, thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much. It's awesome to be here with you, Bill. I appreciate the opportunity. Now, you've told us the whole story of the interview. Why not ask? That's it, right? Interview's over. We're done. (laughs) Now, I know from going through your book, and of course, that's the title, Why Not Ask, you have a very interesting background. So I'm going to ask you to tell us quickly how you went from homeless to Harvard. I learned how to ask because I had to. I was uh, I was homeless. I was pregnant. I was 19 I lost my job, was living out of the back of my car. And uh, I met a woman named Roxanne Yukon, who rest her soul is no longer with us. But she challenged me to write down a goal and and to pray on that. And I went to the welfare office for the first time and they asked me what what I was going to do. What are you going to do, Christine? And I blurted out that goal and said that I was going to go to Harvard. And they laughed at me because that was pretty funny that I was, you know, had just the week before been living in the back of a car and I was sitting there thinking I was going to go to Harvard. And, uh, you know, a lot of life happened in the middle. I married a not so nice guy, had two more kids. I had three kids at the age of 22. I uh, wasn't allowed to work, wasn't allowed to go to school, but my husband at the time couldn't support us. So we did our grocery shopping at the local food bank. We'd boil water on the stove to give our kids baths. Um, I had even went through the garbage can to be able to put gas through it, gas in our car. And I decided one day when I couldn't feed my daughter that I'd had enough and that I needed to have, a, I, that was not the life that I had wanted to live. So I renegotiated with myself first. And then I learned how to ask people for help. And I did that by surrounding myself with people like Roxanne and others who believed in me in me at times when I did not believe in myself. I love that. Surround with people who believe. So that's going to be our first uh, lesson for today. And uh, boo-hoo on your husband for not realizing here he was. He married one of the world's great negotiators and he didn't want you to go to school, go to work or do anything else. So boo-hoo on him. He gets <laughs> thumbs down from the secrets of success. Now, Christine, I know from reading your book, Why Not Ask, that you had an interesting adventure. And to show our audience uh, what a good negotiator you are, uh, you and your husband went car shopping. Want to tell us about that? Yes, um, this was a lot. Of, this is actually a lot of fun. So I have since remarried from my first husband and my my husband Keith and I've been together for twenty eight years now. Um, He's the smart husband who decided, hey, I've got a gem here. Okay, we know that. (laughs) Yeah, he's a pretty amazing guy. Um, And so we his his truck was involved in an accident. We debate whether he wrecked it or I wrecked it. Um, And (laughs) that will we'll take that one to our graves. Um, But I decided I and I just didn't like my car at the time. And I got this crazy idea in my head. I was like, I wonder, I wonder if I could buy two cars, two brand new cars for the price of one. And so instead of sitting and saying to myself, oh, that nobody would ever do that. Who would think about that? What That's not possible. Instead of thinking that way, I set out to prove my hypothesis right. And I got clear with my husband about what was it that we were looking for in car. He wanted a very specific model, which is a Honda Element, which they don't make anymore because it's the most hideous car on the planet. (laughs) An ugly vehicle. It's great if you're 21 and throwing up in your car, you can actually hose the thing out. But that's about all. That was all it was really great for. But he was in love with this car. And I just didn't I don't really care about about those kind of car about cars in general. So. So I was like, can we buy two cars for the price of one? So the first thing we did is we got super clear on what it was we wanted all the way down to what kind of uh, things we wanted to take and take from the dealer. Um, you know, did we want to have the, you know, did we want to get it detailed every few months or not? What kind of warranty we wanted? And we had a pretty exhaustive list of what was possible. And we ordered, we ranked them, what was important to us and what was least important to us. And we did that because the things that were least important to us were going to become the things that we were going to trade off in our negotiation in order to get the things that were most important to us. 
And then the second thing I did is I researched the daylights out of the car dealership. How do car dealers make money? What what does it mean for them when they have a car sitting on the lot? How does a salesperson make money? How do they, how do they sell? What tactics and things do they use to try to sell and to get you to buy at certain prices? And um, how do they how they manage finances? How does the manager come into place? Then I looked at and so I looked at all of that, how they make money. Then I looked at the model. Now, the Honda Element is a very specific vehicle. And as it happens, we drive manual transmissions, which matters because the situations that we're negotiating influence our ability to get a deal. So I researched who drives manual transmissions in Boston, right? In New England at the time, 7% of drivers use, would drive a manual transmission. And let me tell you, Far fewer of those were under the age of 30, which was the target market for the Honda Element. And so I looked for the dealer that had the largest number of manual transmission Honda Elements on their lot. And my theory was that the holding cost of inventory was excessively high for them and that there was a motivation for them to get rid of those vehicles off their lot. And uh, we were, I was, so I walked in and I, my husband had a role and he did the test driving and talked to the salesperson. And when the subject of price came up, I came into that conversation. The dealer, the salesperson said, you know, well, it's going to be list price. And, and my husband's like, what if we get two? It's list price times two. And I said, I think we can do better than that. And I offered to buy two cars for the price of one. We ended up, I ended up being wrong on my inventory holding cost. And so we adjusted our offer up by $5,000. But that night we drove off the lot with two brand new cars for the price of one plus $5,000. You say that uh, when you first told the story so easily, I wanted two cars for the price of one, just like it's done every day, like two nickel candies or something like that, two packs of gum. And these are cars that usually go for, I don't know, I'm going to say a car, I guess, is at least 15000 or so, probably more. Yeah, I think it was like twenty two to twenty five thousand with all the options. So you saved twenty thousand something real quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Exactly. So you're good. Exactly. I want you on my team and I think our audience <laughs> so I think we can trust you on today's show and uh find out more about negotiating. Now going through your book, you say there's four styles of negotiation. Can you tell us what those are? Sure. So the first style is a champion. And when I say champion, I don't mean uh I don't, I don't mean like they're the best of everything at all. A champion, the way that I describe them is that they see the, a negotiation as a battle and they go in fully armed and fully armored and their objective is to annihilate you. And only about 10% of negotiators fall into these, this group, but we all know them. They're the people who brag about getting the best of somebody in the negotiation. And what happens for the champion is that they'll often agree to do things that are not in their best interest simply because they think that they can use that to defeat their opponent. My favorite uh, champion quote uh, from a successful business person. So the style can be successful, but you tend to burn through relationships pretty quick, have high turnover employees, high turnover in suppliers, and you lose customers fast with this style. But his, his, what he said to me one day was, I'd rather see you lose than me win. And that was a classic champion style. The second style, which is on the other end of the spectrum from the champion is a benefactor. And benefactors are conflict avoidant. They tell themselves that they care so much about the relationship that they're just going to give their counterpart everything that they want. So they sacrifice their self-interest for what they believe to be a way of preserving the relationship with their counterpart. The challenge for the benefactor, though, is that what happens when they're conflict avoidant is they're not elevating their voice. And so they're not articulating what it is that they want out of the negotiation. And so when the deal is done, they end up with something that they're very they're very unhappy with oftentimes. And yet they are resentful that they ended up with that, even though they didn't speak up at the time. So what happens for a lot of benefactors is that they can become passive aggressive in the relationship 
or they'll agree to things that they actually cannot deliver on simply because they're trying to get the the conflict or the tension out of the way. And so they say that they're, they think that they're preserving the relationship, but really what they're doing is they're living in fear of that confrontation and it's clouding what they're able to achieve at the negotiation table. The thirds and about 10% of negotiators are benefactors. The third style is the most commonly used style, especially in the Western part of the world. And that is um, a maverick. And mavericks are what I call our checklist negotiators. So they don't, different from the champion who cares about annihilating their opponent, the maverick just doesn't care at all about their opponent. They're, they're, you just happen to be there as a tool to give them what it is they want, but they don't care if you succeed in getting what, get what, getting what you want or not. That's irrelevant to them as long as they're getting what they want out of the negotiation. So they'll go into a negotiation with a list of, let's just say, 10 things. And they look and they they negotiate point one and they get it and they get two and they get three. And they get to point four and their counterpart says, no way am I giving that to you. And they fight hard for it and they get really aggressive and they get really emotional about four, but they didn't get four. And they're really not happy about it. But they get five, they get six, they get seven, they get eight. Same thing that happened with four happens with number nine. They just couldn't get there with it, but they get number 10. So they look at that list of 10 things and they go, all right, I got eight out of 10. So that's that's a good negotiation. But oftentimes what they didn't realize is that points four and nine counted, had more value embedded in them than all the eight things that they actually got. And so what happens for the Maverick is that because they go point by point by point, they lose the opportunity to connect ideas, to bring different ways of looking at things and different perspectives into the negotiation. And they're very myopically focused on what it is that they they want. And so they lose that opportunity to kind of expand the pie and see things in a different way. The ambassador, which is the fourth style and about 25% of negotiators are ambassadors, it's the style that's probably the most naturally inclined to negotiate, um, hence the name ambassador. So they are always looking for different ways of creating more. They're always looking for opportunities to not only get more, but to have their counterpart get more. And they'll look for different ways of they'll bring in different ideas and disparate views They'll look creatively at nuances of things, but they can be a pain in the neck to deal with because they're always looking for that. How do I make it bigger? How do I make it better? And so sometimes they turn mountains into molehills and they're slow in the negotiation process. So time is not one of their favorite things. Christine, I want to know more about this, but at this point in the show, I have to take a brief break and let our audience know that you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Bill Horan. Our guest today is Christine McKay. She's the author of Why Not Ask? And we're going to ask Christine where we can get the book and if there's a website where we can find out more information. Absolutely. So you can get the book right now. It's available on Amazon. That's the easiest and fastest place to go for it. And um, our website for the book is whynotaskbook.com. So very, very simple. And I have a little gift for people if they go there. So, And just the title of the book saying Why Not Ask? Almost as a reminder, if we did that once a day, by the end of the year, we're going to come out. I mean, it might be just something as simple as an extra packet of ketchup or sugar or salt or something like that. But probably if we get into it and read your book and start to say, let me see if I can just be a little more like Christine, we're probably going to be talking about hundreds, maybe even thousands of dollars in savings or benefits that we've gotten. And honestly, why not ask what it doesn't hurt. It's the perfect title for a book. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Christine, most people seem afraid to, to negotiate or hesitant. I, I, I don't want to say they're fearful. Um, are we just lazy or is it the, the fear of rejection, like that date might reject me so I won't ask her out or ask him out? Why don't we try this more? 
Well, we used to when we're, I mean, the best negotiators, I swear to God, are seven years old. <laughs> Every seven-year-old is an amazing negotiator. They're good at using the styles. You've seen my grandson. And, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're resilient and accepting no and moving on. And they they literally embody the concept that no is an invitation to ask another question because they're going to go ask either you in a different way or ask somebody else. And so, but starting at around the age of eight, our mind starts to change. And there's research that actually shows that we start to not ask for things starting around the age of eight. We change how we start negotiating. And so what happens is we, as, a, as adults, we tend to surround ourselves with people who are similar to us. And so as children, we start asking for things in, a, in the way that gets us more yeses than noes. And so that tends to lean toward one of these, a, a specific style, like the ones we just talked about. But as we start to expand our universe, that those styles don't necessarily serve us as effectively as they did when we were when we were younger. And so we start hearing no more and then we become afraid and we start focusing on the nose, because if you actually took and you tallied up all the times that you asked for something, you I guarantee you, you have had a lot more yeses in the world than you have had no's. But we focus on the nose. And it's really because we're afraid of being judged. It's, you know, people say, I can't ask my customer to do that because they'll walk away. They'll go someplace else, or that supplier won't deliver something this that fast, or and just all sorts of things that we tell ourselves. And, and I say in the book that the hardest part of any negotiation happens between our ears. And I spend a lot of time in my in my programs talking and helping people understand who they are as individuals in terms of getting clarity and what what drives them so that they can get comfortable in re in, in re is creating a new view of what no actually means to them, because no is actually a freedom word. No gives us the freedom to say yes in other areas. So in my view, Freedom starts with no. I don't know if you can see how many notes I'm taking down. No is a freedom word. I've got so many markings, I think, more than any other show already on my paper, and we're only halfway through the show. Christine, I I think you talk about having three keys or three circles to negotiation. Can you tell us what those are? Yeah. So, I mean, one of them is you've got to be prepared. This is effective preparation is a huge thing. I mean, if you go back to the example that I talked about with the car, you know, our ability to to buy two brand new cars for the price of one plus five thousand dollars came down entirely to preparation. Nobody had ever gone to this dealer or I, hardly I don't know anybody. I tell this story all the time and no, I've yet to meet anyone who's done this. But nobody goes to a dealer spending time understanding who they are and what they do to make money and what a successful deal looks like to them and then communicates that to them in an open and transparent way. So you absolutely have to be prepared and you have to ask in the right way you have to how you ask matters for things so you have to understand your negotiation style and what is effective about that what's not effective about it and you have to engage effectively Um, one of the biggest mistakes that i see people making is they go in and they demand things and then they don't listen Um, listening is a full contact sport and you know when you're engaging with something somebody the most valuable thing that you can do and what every human being on the planet wants is to be seen, heard, and valued for who they are at this moment in time. Not who they were, not who they have the potential to become, but who they are right now. And by listening and engaging with them effectively, you're able to communicate their importance and that makes the ability to get what you want that much easier and it helps them get what they want. Uh, Christine, I, again, I, I was scribbling notes all through this. My pages are a mess that, that I prepared for the show, but it's important that I take down what you say. You're the expert. At this point, again, I want to let our audience know if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Bill Oran. Our guest today is Christine McKay, spelled M-C-K-A-Y. She's the author of Why Not Ask? 
a conversation about getting more. Isn't that what we want? Christine, can you tell us the website and where we can get the book? So you can get the book on Amazon and the website is whynotaskbook.com. And we'll ask you that one more time. So if uh, listeners didn't get it down or want to, and again, uh, you're going to go home and talk about it to your son, your husband, your sister, and they'll say, what was that website? Where can you get the book? What was the name of that author? Jot it down because you're going to want it in two or three days from now and it'll be too late. Christine, you say uh, don't negotiate against yourself. How do we do that in a day to day, you know, simple negotiations that most of us might be involved in? We do it in a couple of ways. So one is before we even open our mouths, we tell ourselves what's possible and what's not possible. So we we don't even give our counterpart the opportunity to respond to our, a question or a request for what we want. We we like I said earlier, we you know, negotiate with ourselves in our own heads, saying, "Oh my gosh, I can't ask for that because." And so we have these, you know, "I can't" or "I won't" or "I'm not." kind of statements that we embed in our negotiation. And then the other the other way that we do that is that when we're in that dialogue with somebody and we're having that conversation and somebody, you know, says no, right? They they say no, then our immediate reaction is that we physically recoil to no and then we try to fix, we try to fix it. We're like, oh my gosh, they said no. So what do I need to do to get them to say yes? Well, what if I do this? What if I cut my price? What if I give you a discount? What if I deliver faster? What if it, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, instead of just stopping and asking a question about, well, tell me more about what you're saying no to, because sometimes it's not we're saying no out of a, 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 the, the no that we're getting is a reaction to a part of the request, but not the whole of the request. Right. And what happens is if we try to fix a problem or provide a solution before we even know what the problem is, that's when we're negotiating with ourselves because we don't we're trying to solve for something and we don't even know what the heck we're solving for. So let our counterparts tell us. Christine, I'm just wondering, are your friends and neighbors and coworkers, are they a little afraid of you, like not knowing if you have a secret gun? Like if you say good morning, uh oh, what does she want from me? She must be setting me up. She wants me to take her to lunch, to dinner or a free book or something. You know, I, I, you'd have to ask them. Um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty laid back. I'm, I'm so transparent. I, I'm not a, I'm not a gamey person. So I actually get frustrated when people talk about negotiation as poker or chess game or some kind of game. For me, negotiation is a conversation about our relationship. And I value my relationships and I want to get more value out of those relationships. And I want my counterparts to get more value out of our relationship. And so I just take a different approach. And I don't know if it comes from being a, you know, even though I live in the big city, I, I'm at, the, at my core, I'm just a country girl from a tiny, tiny town in North Central Montana. And I just and I just value the relationship aspect of things. So I don't, you know, people try to play games with me in a negotiation and I'm good at calling them on those games saying, we don't, we don't need to do that here. We, we can, we can accomplish what we're trying to accomplish by leaving the games on the, on the sideline. We don't need to do that. This is a unique compliment, but I want to tell you, you remind me of the serial killer who everybody says he couldn't have done it. He's so mild. He's meek. He doesn't, he wouldn't kill a bug. And you look like such a nice, and I, I mean this as a compliment, average person, whether you told me you were a doctor, college professor, lawyer, or accountant, or actuary, I would believe any of those. And you smile, and you seem very engaging, but somehow I think you have a knife behind you that's, and if I turn around, you're going to stab <laughs> me and get a free car out of me. So I'm, I'm really worried about you that, you know, you, you, you I, I think, um, put people to sleep a little bit and they say, oh, she wouldn't do that. And then boom, you get them. Um, I definitely know how to be firm when I need I to bet be. you do. And, I and bet I you am, do. And I'm certainly not afraid of asking for what I want. I see that now. And that leads perf- perfectly to the next question. You say to give yourself permission to think bigger. Why do most of us, and I, I'm guilty of this too, if I was to ask for something, someone else would say, ask for $100. i say, no, no, I'll ask for $10 off. And if they gave me that camera for $10 off or that phone, oh boy, I made a $10 deal. And maybe the guy says, I'm going to give him 100 if he asked for it, but you know, we'll leave it there. Why are we, I think most people are like that too. Why is that? 
Well, I think, I mean, it's a combination of things. I think we're taught from a young age to to do that, to discount what we want, to, you know, to, we have this, this really intriguing no, notion of what's fair um, and, and sharing and what those mean and those definitions, however we define them in, as, as individuals and whatever we've been taught when we, from when we were children, those things continue to apply. And, you know, there's a research study out of Boston College that talks about how boys and girls negotiate differently and how girls really start to stop negotiating with, with men starting at around the age of eight. And we see how that continues, you know, in life. Um, and so I think we, part of it is we just get used to it and we're not negotiation skills are not taught by really anyone. I mean, I was honored to go to Harvard, but even at Harvard, right there, it's not like a, a massive class in negotiation. It's a partial, it's not even a full semester. So it's just a part and, and lawyers, no offense to all any of the attorneys or, uh, you know, would be attorneys who are listening, but you're not going to get taught how to negotiate either. Real estate agents not taught how to negotiate. I mean, you, you, you've got some fields where that is where people learn how to negotiate. But the thing is, is that nobody teaches us how to be intentional. Uh, and people tell us things like, um, well, control your emotions. Well, baloney. You just feel what you feel. You can't control your emotions, but you can control how you react to them. But we're taught not to not to think that way. We're taught not to embrace our emotions. And negotiation is inherently emotional. We feel before we think. And when what I learned is that when I recognized that people felt before they thought and I could tap into that, I could learn a lot more about myself. I could learn a lot more about my counterparts and I could learn a lot more about the situations and environments that I was negotiating in. And it led to massive amounts of success. And my last and a 10 second question, who's better men or women? It depends on what the word negotiating. Um, We negotiate differently. Men are much better, tend to be, in my experience, better at haggling. So if there's a limited number of things or I want to, or it's like I got to go in and it's a battle to get something, men tend to be better in my experience around that. And women tend to be more nuanced in the negotiation. They tend to be more relationship focused and oriented and tend to be more um, willing to look at a broader picture versus just kind of what's that one thing that they're negotiating right now. Um, But I mean, research suggests that men and women are both great negotiators. It just depends on what we're negotiating. Uh, Christine, before we wrap up, once again, I'd like our audience to know our guest today has been Christine McKay. She's the author of Why Not Ask? And please tell us the website where we can find out more. Yes. Why not ask a conversation about getting more? You can buy it at Amazon and our website is whynotaskbook.com. Christine, we want to thank you for being our guest today on The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Horan, asking you to please join us again next week at the same time when we will continue our journey to success.